Thank you, Damien, for that prayer. And uh, as Damien mentioned, it was my birthday yesterday, the anniversary of my birth. And uh, usually I don't pay much attention to birthdays. You know, they come, they go. Uh, But it was not just any birthday. It was my 65th birthday. I'm officially a senior, which seems really strange to me. And to be honest, I wasn't really thrilled about it. You see, I've, I've noticed some changes happening specifically in my body, like uh, things that I've not noticed before, but I suspect with age they come to most of us. For one, my muscles have disappeared. You know, I, I mean, I never had really huge muscles before, but at least they were there and they, you know, they did the job and they worked pretty well. But the ones I have left, they're just, you know, I know sort of just a bit flabby. Like, they just, they don't work like they used to. And, you know, my skin has begun to look different. Like, I look at my skin and and I think, oh my goodness, like it's it's getting thin. You know, I, I remember people used to talk about onion skin. I had no idea what they're talking about. But now I look at my skin, I think, oh, it's kind of wrinkly. Like, what what's going on here? Like, what happened? What, I used to be a young man, and, and something changed, and now I'm an old man, and I'm not really excited <laughs> about these changes. Now, <clears throat> I suspect my lack for enthusiasm, that I'm, just, I'm not alone in that, my, uh, you know, changes that happen to us, we're, we're not always excited about that. And we've experienced so much change, especially in the last six months, and it may be just even overwhelming to think about it. COVID-19 has changed so much of our lives. We can't relate to family and friends like we used to. Uh, We cannot shop like we used to. We cannot go to church like we used to. The mask, you know, once we, we saw it only you know, in medical sorts of situations. And now it's part of daily life. And uh, I don't know how many of you, like, are there any of you here today that are just excited about wearing a mask? Like, do you wake up in the morning and say, I can hardly wait till I can put on a mask? No, none of us. None of us like this too much. So, you know, change robs us of the normal, comfortable ways that have allowed us to enjoy life. Uh, Change challenges us. It complicates our lives. Now, interestingly, change is, it's, it's not new to the world. Over 300 years ago, a man by the name of Christopher Bullock wrote in a novel that he was writing, The Cobbler of Preston, he wrote these words, "'Tis impossible to be sure of anything but death and taxes. So he could have added change. He could have said, in this world, nothing can be said to be certain except death and taxes and change. Change is one of the constant themes of our lives. It is in our day. It was 300 years ago. It was in Jesus' day. So why do I say it was part of Jesus' day? Because even in his day, Jesus had to help people navigate change. Turn with me in your Bibles, or if you have an electronic Bible, just turn it on, or it might even be on the screen above me. Uh, We want to read from Matthew chapter 9, and we're going to read verses 14 through 17. And then we will turn over a few chapters to Matthew 15 and read verses 1 through 2. And in these verses, we see people wrestling with change. So let's, let's see what's happening. Matthew 9, 14 through 17. Then John's disciples came to him and asked him, How is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? Jesus answered, 
How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? The time will come when the bridegroom will be taken from them. Then they will fast. No one sews a patch of unshrunk cloth on an old garment, for the patch will pull away from the garment, making the tear worse. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And then in Matthew chapter 15, verses 1 and 2, the Bible tells us there that then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, Why do your disciples break the traditions of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, I want us to take note of three truths about change from these verses. The first truth is this. Change is difficult. Now, perhaps you uh, sense this reality as we read the scripture. People were complaining, and they're complaining about change. We heard it first from John's disciples. They say, how is it that we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? You see, there are certain ways to behave as good Jews. Fasting was a part of that. And no one notices a lack of fasting like those who are fasting. <clears throat> they are not happy. And you can tell by the way they ask the question. It all, almost comes across as an accusation. But we also hear it from the Pharisees. In chapter 15, they ask, Why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, why questions are often accusatory in nature. Why questions are often inspired by, you know, upset feelings, anger. So, you may hear, why were you so late for dinner? You know, there, there's feeling, there's intensity there. Or you may say, why did you let this happen to me, God? You hear the why question. And in this case, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? And then comes the complaint. This is the, this is the transgression. They don't wash their hands before they eat. Now, here are some people having trouble coping with change. You know, for years, there were certain ways of doing things that all godly people recognized as being right. And then along comes Jesus with his 12 disciples, and they did not behave in the manner appropriate to their standing. Now, you know, the Pharisees weren't friendly toward Jesus, so we should expect them to be a little bit antagonistic. But John's disciples were on good terms with Jesus, and they too are having trouble understanding this change. And so we learn this truth. People, both friends and enemies, have trouble with change. They find it difficult. So Edward the Elephant was not born in Africa, but he was born in North America. His mother was a circus elephant, and that was going to be his destiny too. So as a baby elephant, he was restrained by a chain. They put one end of the chain around his little leg, and then they tied it over to a, a steel peg or stake that they pounded in the ground. Now, as a little guy, Edward would pull against that chain, but he discovered no matter how hard he pulled against it, it never budged. And so in his mind, he said, okay, just be content. Whenever you're tied to this chain you know you're not going anywhere. So he gave up trying. As the years passed, Edward changed. <laughs> right? He grew from a baby elephant into a, a full-grown adult elephant. And as he grew, his strength was enormous. 
Although he didn't know it, he could have easily pulled free from his restraint. But he was bound by something stronger. In his mind, change in this situation was out of the question. Edward, the elephant, and the Pharisees, and John's disciples, they all have this in common. They were bound by their past and could not see, would not see, any change in their thinking and consequently their behavior. We risk being bound by the same mental restraints if we're not careful. It's important that we recognize the challenge, the difficulty that change brings to life. It's not easy. It is, in fact, difficult, but it's a necessary part of the Christian life. I remember reading a quote by Dwight Ruff, who at the time was a member of the Yorkton, Saskatchewan Chamber of Commerce. He said this, The biggest problem we have in this province is that people are afraid of change. Change is good. Now, he said change is good is because he was wanting to change something, (laughs) right? Uh, He said this because there was this great movement of resistance in his town against changing to daylight time. Now, you know, Saskatchewan is the only province in Canada uh, that doesn't change its clocks in the fall and spring. So let's try an experiment. Put your hands together. Like, put your hands up like this. Just put them together. Like, like just, okay. Now, everyone got that? Okay, here's what I want you to do. I want you to move your fingers over one digit. That doesn't feel right, does it? It feels a bit awkward, isn't that right? feels awkward. Now, let me ask you this. Is it morally wrong? <laughs> no. No, it's not. Is it sinful? <laughs> no. But it just doesn't feel right. All my life, I've clasped my hands like this. So any other way, it just can't be right. <laughs> Just this week, I was part of a discussion uh, that addressed the needs to make some changes in an organization of which I'm a part. And my head recognized the need, but uh, it was hard to move it to my heart. So we looked at all the options. There, there are about three different options. And as we looked at the options, the, the one that was the best was really obvious. Uh, I felt resistance in me, and as I said, it wasn't necessarily from my head, it was from my heart and my will. And someone in that meeting said to me, and I don't know why they picked me, there were other people there, but they just said to me, so Hamish, how are you feeling about this change? And then in that moment, uh, it occurred to me, or maybe better, that the Lord opened my eyes And I responded, you know, my feelings are irrelevant. Because the need here should drive the solution, not my comfort. Because honestly, I don't feel good about this option. And yet, the only reason I think right now that I don't want this option, I don't feel good about it, is because I've never done it that way before. And so that was my resistance. Part of me wanted to reject the right thing because why? It was different. It was a change. And it required something more of me than my current practice did. So we come to believe in a falsehood. We believe that change is only right and good when it's easy and natural. This is wrong. Some of the biggest changes in life are more difficult than ever and far from natural. But once they're made, they bring tremendous blessing. Have you ever broken a bad habit? How easy is it? But yet when it's broken, your life knows freedom 
and joy. Have you ever started an exercise program? You know, you, you ever wake up and say, oh, I just, I just feel like exercise. You know, I, I don't often feel like exercise. <laughs> My wife does, but I don't. So I have to discipline myself. But you know what? After I change, then I start to feel good about it. Was it easy for you to die to self and trust your life to Jesus Christ? I don't know about you, but I struggled with that. It took me a while to surrender my life, my, my old comfortable way of living to Jesus Christ. Change is difficult. It was difficult for the Pharisees, for John's disciples. It's difficult for us, but it doesn't mean it's bad or evil. Someone has said that all change, even good change, is initially viewed as loss. When God moved Abraham out of Ur, you can bet there was a sense of loss. But the change was a part of God's plan to bless the world. Even when the Hebrews left their slavery in Egypt for the promised land, they kept looking back. It got tough. They looked back to Egypt. We can't let the difficulty of change keep us looking back at the glories of the past. We need to look ahead in faith with eager expectation to the fruit that God wants to produce in us. Now, it's interesting that in this situation, not everybody was unhappy, right? Jesus and the twelve were not troubled by the new way. Others were, but they weren't. And again, there's a lesson here for us. Some of us may embrace change easily, while others find it very difficult. We must love one another enough not to rush into things necessarily, We must give those who need it the time to grieve the loss. You know, the Bible tells us that a good many of the priests became obedient to the faith. Now, that was change for them. And it isn't that people refuse to change. It's just that some of us need a little more time than others. Love means giving one another time and grace in the process of embracing change. So that's our first truth. Change is difficult. Second truth, change is often authored by God. You hear that? Change is often authored by God. Matthew 9.15 says this, Jesus answered, How can the guests of the bridegroom mourn while he is with them? So who defended the disciples' behavior? More than that, who gave them permission not to fast? Who led out in this new behavior? Jesus. Jesus did. Who gave the disciples permission not to wash their hand and so break the tradition of the elders? Jesus. That's who. You know, when your leader's with you, (laughs) you know, you parents, you may say to your kids, as they come to the the table to eat. Have you washed your hands? (laughs) You follow the cues of the leader. And Jesus is their leader. And we see here that Jesus is often at the heart of change. God is, in fact, a change agent. He's in the business of making old things new. And the newness replaces that oldness in Isaiah 43, 19. The Lord says, see, I'm doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? No, they did not perceive it. Because they thought, once law, always law. Change is the enemy. You know, they didn't understand that the law was the vehicle which brought them to God's grace in Jesus. That God was bringing into being a new covenant And in this new covenant, men and women in Christ become new creations. And for this new creation awaited a new life. And in this new life, we are to serve God in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of the written code. 
God is in the process of making all things new. And the promise of the scripture is that he is preparing a new heaven and a new earth. And in this, we are tempted to believe another falsehood. Change is the enemy. It's not good. But what if Jesus is the author of that change? He gave us a new commandment. He interpreted old traditions in new ways. Because of him, his followers began to worship him in new ways and on a new day. And all this change was initiated and carried out in obedience to his Father's will. So did Jesus die on the cross so I could do what comes natural and easy? No. He died so that my life could be resurrected from its deadness and moved into such a life with him that it bears much fruit and so glorifies God. In John 15, Jesus describes his father as the gardener and us as the branches. And what did the father do to the branches? Jesus says he pruned them. Pruning is the process by which a tree or a vine is changed. It's a good change. Now, it's not without pain, but it's good. And it is the Father who is bringing about this change. It is God who is doing the pruning. Now, we are wise to recognize God's initiative in change. In Acts 5, the apostles were arrested and put in jail for preaching about Jesus. The religious leaders were discussing what to do with them since they had chosen to ignore their edict that they should not speak about Jesus anymore. One of their number, Gamaliel, urged the religious leaders to do nothing to them. Now listen to his reasoning. He says this, Therefore, in this present case, I advise you, leave these men alone. Let them go, for if their purpose or activity is of human origin, it will fail. But if it is from God, you will not be able to stop these men. You will only find yourselves fighting against God. Gamaliel recognized that God is often the author of change. We should too. In fact, God demands that we recognize the changes that he wants to make in us. Ephesians 4, 17 and verses 22 to 24 say this. So I tell you this and insist on it in the Lord. Let me just stop there for a second. Do you hear how powerfully Paul is addressing people? You know, he says, I tell you this and I insist on it in the Lord that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. So, he's talking about a change. You were taught with regard to your former way of life to put off your old self, which is being corrupted by its deceitful desires, to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on the new self created to be like God and true righteousness and holiness. Paul is demanding that God's people embrace change as a way of life. God-inspired, God-directed change. Now, if we think about this truth as a church, we will recognize that God has been initiating change in us. I'm not just speaking about the kind of outward sort of organizational changes that come when one church merges with another. I'm not talking about those things. I'm speaking about the kind of change that is wrought deep down in the hearts of a people. Do we exist for ourselves, or do we exist to further God's purposes in the world? Now, we may view this pandemic as a bad thing, And in many ways, it is bad. It has changed the way we worship, the way we fellowship, the way we do church. People are dying. People are isolated. 
But hear this, God is not, God has not been hemmed in by this virus. And perhaps, and we need to think about this prayerfully, carefully, perhaps he is using it to initiate some changes in us that will make us better to fulfill our primary assignment from him. Our assignment from him is to make disciples of Jesus Christ and teach them how to obey him in everything. That's our assignment. Are there changes that this virus has inspired that will make us, as a church, better disciple makers of the Lord Jesus Christ? I wonder how all those first century Christians felt when persecution became so great that they were scattered all across the Roman Empire. You know, did they feel good about that? Did they say, man, I love the change in my lifestyle? (laughs) I'm sure they did not. But was it not a catalyst for the rapid spread of Christianity? Brothers and sisters, we must be careful to discern the work of God and change. Joseph could say of all the evil his brothers did to him and about all the changes that meant for him from favorite son to prisoner in a foreign land that what they meant for evil, God meant for good. God may want to change some things about our church. Are we poised and ready to bear the fruit he desires in the next few years? Have we made the necessary changes in order to ready ourselves to run the race with him. So that's our second truth from these texts, that God often initiates and authors change. The third is this. Change is necessary. In nine, Matthew 9, 17, Jesus says this. Neither do men pour new wine into old wineskins. If they do, the skins will burst, the wine will run out, and the wineskins will be ruined. No, they pour new wine into new wineskins, and both are preserved. In this passage, Jesus notes that change is essential. Without change, all is lost, both the wine and the wineskin. In this parable, Jesus speaks of Wine skins and wine, you know, in those days, a wine skin was just a goat skin that was sewn up so that it was leak proof, and wine was stored in these skins. Now, new wine continues to ferment, and the skins stretch with the fermentation process. Old skins, brittle with age, would not stretch, and instead they would crack and burst, and the wine would be lost and the wine skin ruined. No one in his right mind would ever put new wine into an old wineskin. So Jesus uses the wisdom of his day, and he applies it to their lives with God. He says, in essence, that the old wineskin of Judaism would not be able to contain the new wine of the gospel. Change was necessary. The entire book of Hebrews was written to help Jewish Christians understand the changes. Does anybody remember that that old Canadian iconic store named Eaton's? (laughs) Some of you who are new to Canada, you might not remember Eaton's. Eaton's was around for over 100 years. And uh, they went out of business. Why? You know what one of their executives said? We have not recognized the changes in consumer shopping. They went out of business. Has our culture changed in the last 30, 35 years? Has our way of thinking and communicating changed? Did anyone ever in their wildest imagination think that the internet was possible 35 years ago? that we'd all have these little things in our pockets called cell phones. The old days, somebody called, you had to run to the house to get get the phone because it was attached to the wall. There's more computing power in your digital watch 
than all the computers on the Apollo 11 spacecraft that carried Neil Armstrong and Buzz Aldrin to the moon in 1969. The new wine of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ, that people can be forgiven and saved from eternal death, forgiven of their sins and have eternal life with God, it needs to be proclaimed. Is it effective to proclaim this message in the same way we have in the past? In the past, ordinary people outside the church, uh, at least they knew about the Bible. They might even have a Bible. They knew about God and Jesus. You know, this is not so true any longer. People have little consciousness of personal sin, and thus they feel little need to be saved from sin's penalty. I remember one pastor telling me once that somebody in his community asked him for a bibble, a bibble. So, so ignorant that he didn't know how to say Bible. Grew up all his life in Canada and wanted to know, do you have a Bible for me? Probably never heard the word growing up. Does that say something about our need to change the way we engage our culture with the gospel? This past week, it was reported widely in the news that some street preachers set up some amplifiers and loudly proclaimed the evils of homosexuality in the West End of Vancouver. There was an altercation, and somehow in the scuffle, a man's leg was broken. I dare say that few people were won to Jesus that day. And even more will hold Christians in contempt. If we are not careful about the way we share the gospel in our culture, it could be equivalent to pouring new wine into old wineskins, and the result is that both the hearer and the message are lost. In the past, people had a great deal of free time. I don't remember if you, you know, 30 years ago, we'd say, in the future, we won't know what to do with all our free time. Now, how many of you had tons of free time this week? <laughs> I, bet you, I bet you you're thinking, free time, what are you talking about? You know, people uh, oftentimes survived off of one income. Yeah, dad went to work or mom went to work, but not both. <laughs> you know, um, people could devote a lot of time to church. For, there was no competition for their time. Stores were closed on Sundays. Sport wasn't a false god. Fitness wasn't the false god. Um, you know, we can disciple people uh, in their walk with the Lord. Uh, can we do that like we used to? Or do we need to change our methods and programs to reflect our age? Do we need to say, Lord Jesus, help us know how to disciple people in our time? Or do we say, um, well, if people were truly godly, if people truly loved Jesus, they would, they would what? Accept the tradition of the elders? Accept the fact that we don't believe in change? Now, this is a, this is a tricky issue. We do not want to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but occasionally, under the leadership of the Lord Jesus Christ, who's the head of our church, we do need to change the water. In our church's life, we may need to set aside some of the things that we've always done in order to advance the kingdom of God here in our present time. We may need to change or eliminate some of our programs to better reach and disciple our neighborhood and world. We may need to make, I like the word, adjustments. But you know, that's just a fancy word for changes in our personal lives to see the fruit that God wants to produce in us. The point is this. Change is necessary. It's necessary personally and as a church family to live life with Jesus is to change 
to resist changes, the changes he desires to make in us is, well, it's rebellion. Change is essential. So let let me conclude with these thoughts. The glory of change, the glory of change is it allows us to be transformed by his power so that his will will be made real in our lives. The glory of change is it allows people to believe that they do not have to settle for mundane, fruitless, joyless living, but instead have the life that Jesus offers, the abundant life. The glory of change is that it gives us a powerful testimony to the presence of the resurrected Lord and his power at work in our lives. The glory of change is that it prepares us to serve our neighborhoods, our city, with relevancy and power. You know, Edward, that elephant that I talked about at the beginning, one day he broke free from his restraints. There was a fire at the circus. (laughs) And uh, when the smoke filled up his area, in his terror, he pulled that stake out of the ground and he charged to freedom. I trust that we, as God's people, are able to change with grace. I pray that we are able to follow the leading of the Lord Jesus without the crisis of fire in our midst. Like, personally, I don't want God to give me a Damascus Road experience to help me change. I don't want to find myself in the belly of a great fish because I refuse to change. I want to be so sensitive to the Lord Jesus Christ. I want us as a people to be so sensitive to the moving of his Holy Spirit that we can change with grace. Now this will touch our lives in two ways, at least two, maybe more, but let me just share with you two. First, personally, God may want to make some changes in your lives, in your personal life. Are there parts of your life that you have kept from him? Are there habits that need to be changed so that God has his way with you, so that God is glorified in you? Are there spiritual disciplines that you must begin to practice in order to walk more closely with him? Like, all these things require that you abandon something and embrace Jesus. And that means change. Are you willing to make these adjustments that God asks for you? You know, we always close our service by singing a couple of songs. And those songs are meant for you to reflect on what God is saying to you. And and whether you're in the fellowship hall or here at home, you may need to listen to what the voice of God would say to you this morning about your own life. So I would encourage you, you let others sing, and you listen for the voice of God and surrender yourself to him. But secondly, as a church family, are we willing to nurture a willingness to go with God wherever he leads us, regardless of the changes we may have to make? Will we decide now to be slow to say no? You know, that's our... (laughs) Well, you just (laughs) know. You know, my mother used to say, don't ask your dad when he gets home, because he'd always say no. You know, it's instinctual. Dad, can we... No. (laughs) Wait, wait a bit. Wait till he's had his supper. As a church, let's wait until we pray about it. Bring it before the Lord before we say, no, we can't do that. You know, will we be slow to say no to new ideas or change? Certainly not before we take them before the Lord in prayer. You know, most of us are here today because those who followed Jesus before us were not content with the status quo. They were not satisfied with the way Things were, 
They, they were not satisfied that so few of their family or their neighbors knew and loved Jesus. They were not satisfied in living life for themselves, but they chose instead to live missional lives for the sake of others. The obvious question for those of us here today, for those of us who are the beneficiaries of their willingness to embrace change, is this, are we ready to embrace the changes that the Lord Jesus brings to us that we might continue as a church to prosper God's kingdom purposes in this place? Change is a significant part of our lives. We are so blessed to have the Lord Jesus lead us into the future. I have every confidence that that journey into the future, those next few years, will be a journey of joyous adventure with Him who is making all things new. Yes, change is difficult, but it's often initiated by God and essential to seeing His purposes realized. Let us then be a people who are willing to embrace the change that God desires to make in us. Let's pray together. Father God, <clears throat> thank you for your patience in walking with us as individuals and as a church. Father, we thank you for the changes that you have made in us. Thank you for forgiving us of our sin and giving us new life in Jesus. Thank you that we have been able to exchange hell for heaven, life for death, or death for life. Father, that, that we can be fully alive in your kingdom right now. Father, thank you that I don't always have to be impatient and angry and, and, you know, all those bad things that I naturally sort of came with. But God, that you, by the work of your Holy Spirit, are changing me, changing us, so that the fruit of your Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, all these things are being produced in us. What a wonderful change. And so, Father, help us as your people not to be afraid of change even COVID change. God, help us look to you, and we pray that you would lead us in the changes that we need to make, whether they're in our person or whether they're in us as a church family. Father, grant us the courage just to hear your voice and to say yes to you. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.